All right, we are live. Okay, welcome everybody to another episode of Secular Jihadists for a Muslim Enlightenment. Uh, my name is Ali Rizvi, and with me, as always, is Armin Navabi. Armin, how are you? Good, thank you. Okay, and what we're... Sorry about the echo. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go right into it, because this is a topic that you've heard us talk about a lot on this podcast, and we feel it's finally getting some attention, and uh, we have actually a very uh, honored guest here today, um, who I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, he was able to join us and give us his time. Um, uh, we are with Nuri Turkel. So uh, the background is this. There are up to 2 million Uyghurs who are currently being held in World War II-style concentration camps in China as we speak. Okay, they're being subjected to torture. They're sub being subjected to forced indoctrination. That There's human trafficking, organ harvesting, forced sterilization, and a number of other egregious human rights abuses. Um, and, and this is obviously part of a massive ethnic and cultural genocide effort. Um, our guest today, Nuri Turkel, uh, he is commissioner at the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. He's worked with a number of administrations in the US uh, from both parties. Um, he is also a member of the Uyghur community. He grew up in the in the in East Turkestan or the Xinjiang region, uh, and he is here to join us to talk about the conflict and uh, to educate us about it, and also tell us his story and some of his work and how all of us can get together and raise awareness about this issue, and not only do that but also help out. This is obviously uh, Nuri. Welcome to the show. This is one of the worst human rights disasters in current times. It's something we've been talking about. Uh, we always said never again, uh, you know, after World War II, after the Holocaust. And what we're seeing right now is something uh, very, very similar that's happening. So uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. So just to start, I wanted to um, ask you if you could, because there are many people who are completely unaware of this, which is very unfortunate. Uh, could you give us a quick summary of what's happening uh, right now um, with your people uh, in the place that you grew up? Um, the Uyghur's ancestral homeland, known as East Turkestan, that the Chinese government uh, calls the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, uh, is located in the heart of Central Asia. Uh, the the landmass uh, is equivalent to four times the size of California, the size of the uh, Western Europe. Uh, the Chinese government uh, official statistics uh, show that Uyghur population is about 12 million. Uh, but the Uyghur diaspora and the Uyghur uh, political leadership believe that the numbers, uh, the number could be uh, higher. Uh, and also, um, uh, the outside of China, there is a sizable Uyghur diaspora community uh, in Central Asia, uh, in uh, in Anatolia, uh, in uh, Europe, North America, Australia, Japan, New Zealand. Uh, in the United States, there are about 8,000 uh, Uyghurs uh, living uh, mainly in the West Coast and uh, East Coast, uh, particularly Washington, D.C. area. And then uh, in Canada, there are a sizable uh, Uyghur community in uh, Alberta and uh, uh, Ontario. Um, there's some uh, uh, growing uh, Uyghur community in Montreal as well. Um, the, in, uh, the largest Uyghur community outside of China uh, could be in Uzbekistan uh, and Kazakhstan. Uh, Uzbek government does not officially recognize um, the Uyghur population, but in Kazakhstan, they're about, uh, I believe there are about 1 million Uyghurs living. Uh, and Turkey has also about, uh, Turkey has about 50,000 Uyghurs living in the country. So, um, and most of those Uyghurs are political refugees. Um, some of them left in the early, uh, 50s after the communists took over of Uyghur's homeland, East Turkestan, with the help of uh, uh, Stalin's Soviet Union. And some of them left after the collapse of the Soviet Union because of the increased political pressure. And then since 2009, there's some young uh, generation uh, newcomers uh, arrived to various uh, communities around the world in Europe, North America, and uh, uh, in the Pacific region. So... Um, China's government uh, in the last three years, uh, particularly since uh, late 2016, with the arrival of this um, the Chinese communist leader uh, by the name Chen Chengguo that you may have read on the paper recently because he got uh, sanctioned uh, under the Global Magnitsky Act um, early this month. So uh, 
after he arrived from Tibet, um, he was given the necessary tools and um, authority, uh, resources to uh, tighten up uh, the Communist Party's grip on the region. So in order to please his uh, superior, Xi Jinping, uh, this individual um, uh, using the local legislation, legislative body, quote unquote legislative body, to come up with something called uh, de extremification measure in April 2017, which is very similar to the measures that uh, that has been implemented in Hong Kong. Of course, the one in Hong Kong called National Security Law, the one that they uh, put in place is a de-extremification measure because Uyghurs happen to be conveniently for Chinese uh, political purposes, uh, Muslim people. So uh, that particular uh, uh, legislation, uh, I keep using legislation because it's nothing like a legislation that we know in the uh, liberal democracies. Yeah. Um, uh, for the purpose of this conversation, um, because it's uh, you know pro formulated, put in place by local legislation, legislative body, even if it's a rubber stem. So basically, it, it that the extremification measure uh, enacted in April 20, uh, April one two thousand seventeen um, sanctioned uh, criminalized uh, forty eight behaviors uh, that includes uh, uh, stop smoking, drinking. Um, uh, discouraging family members from uh, getting into a relationship with non-Uyghur, non-Muslim uh, people. Uh, it, it also includes growing beard, uh, praying, keeping Quran, praying mat. Uh, and um, uh, so the Foreign Affairs magazine, a, a foreign policy magazine, uh, has a, a an extensive article uh, specific laser, uh, laser specifically what could get you to the concentration camp? Um, they call it re-education camp, internment camp, but now concentration camp is a more common terminology. So that uh, two incident, I would say, one is uh, the arrival of this uh, individual, some uh, policy experts and activists uh, 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 describe as uh, modern day Adolf Heichmann, because he is the one who is largely responsible for formulating the genocidal policies being implemented, the concentration of camps, um, building uh, this surveillance state uh, after he was successful testing out in, in, in Tibet, and after the similar type of measures being tested out uh, under the guise of social credit system in other parts of China. So um, he was, um, and also he got a promoted uh, to become a member of the powerful Politburo. Uh, usually provincial level leadership uh, does not get to that point, uh, but he was rewarded with that authority uh, recognition by Xi Jinping uh, uh, himself. Um, and then uh, in summer 2017, um, with the help of uh, something called IJOP, uh, Integrated Joint Operating System, that the Chinese authorities uh, developed and utilized, they started mass arrests. From the April 1 uh, through the summer 2017, they initially rounded up um, government officials, uh, accusing them of being uh, two-faced officials that included influential uh, academics, uh, soccer players, uh, musicians, uh, stage performers, uh, authors, religious leaders. So after that part of the process being done, they uh, start arresting people based on the algorithm. Uh, just in the summer 2017, uh, based on the IJOP revelation of last year, uh, uh, investigative journalism consortium uh, released a batches of documents, including operating manual, uh, which is very similar to uh, the pages from the Nazi uh, playbook. So um, they start running up people, uh, people who had foreign travel uh, history, especially those who have been to 26 countries, that includes the United States, Germany, Turkey, all the stands in Central Asia, including Malaysia in, uh, in uh, South Pacific Asia, Asian uh, region. Um, 
And then uh, they start uh, pressuring the governments in Egypt and other places to repatriate um, or forcibly return Uyghur students, especially those who are religious students. Wow. And then in 2018, we start hearing about these camps through uh, personal accounts, uh, personal survivors' accounts, uh, namely the Kazakh individuals based in Kazakhstan. And then in, in summer 2018, the United Nations uh, a panel, uh, uh, Committee on Elimination of uh, Racial Discrimination publicly challenged China, uh, calling it um, no rights zone, up to a million people being locked up, uh, and then uh, and then the world start paying attention. And today, um, the fast forward, uh, based on various government um, statistics uh, put out put it out put out by the United States government, uh, and based on the uh, satellite imagery uh, based on the population uh, population survey, based on the uh, percentage of the local population who have disappeared, um, uh, scholars, experts, um, uh, people with uh, technical know-how uh, skills, uh, estimated that uh, anywhere between 1.8 million to 3 million people have been uh, locked up in these camps. Since the COVID, uh, we've been uh, reading, hearing uh, more disturbing news, uh, uh, including the following one. Uh, recently, New York Times reported that the PPEs that we've been using uh, in various uh, countries around the world, the and healthcare, healthcare providers been using in our hospitals, uh, uh, most likely been produced by enslaved Uyghurs. And then, uh, as, as creepy as it may sound, uh, Early this month, uh, CBP uh, seized 13 tons of Uyghur woman's hair. Um, and also, um, uh, Australian think tank, uh, Australian Strategic Policy Institute, uh, issued a report uh, uh, with the titles and Uyghurs are for sale uh, that identified 83 companies uh, that includes Google, Apple, uh, Muji's, Uniqlo, Hugo Boss, um, uh, Volkswagen. A uh, bunch of companies uh, that have been using uh, the forced labor uh, through their supply chain. Uh, so, and then, uh, the, and then, the international community uh, still trying to figure out, sadly, uh, to respond to, respond to this ongoing uh, human dying crisis that uh, some U.S. officials likened uh, to uh, the regrettable pages of history and during the Second World War. So, um, in short, um, the Uyghurs have been subject to modern-day uh, ethnic cleansing, uh, being subject to a genocidal policy, uh, China's uh, genocidal policies, and also um, uh, by using enslaved Uyghur labor, Chinese government, uh, Chinese entities have polluted uh, the global economic system with tainted products that they've been uh, providing to the uh, various markets, uh, including to our stores here. Uh, last year, um, uh, Costco uh, removed uh, baby pajamas from their shelves uh, that are that were uh, believed to be produced by uh, uh, Uyghurs who were in the forced labor camps. Well, that's incredible. How do you, how do you respond to people who are skeptical about these reports? We get like when we try to bring attention to this, we always get those comments that people are saying, "No, this is not happening. These are lies." People are exaggerating. Um, you don't know this would be true. Um, How is, would you respond that, to this? That people? kind of skepticism um, does not have um, uh, evidentiary uh, backing. And then two, I think it's an emotional reaction. Uh, a three, uh, that is basically either wittingly, unwittingly uh, echo on the Chinese propaganda. That's exactly what the Chinese uh, authorities would like the international community, particularly the people in the Muslim countries, to think that this is a game that the United States is playing by using few uh, academics, a handful of uh, 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 quote-unquote local victims um, to um, create this atmosphere to hamper China rights. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a playbook from the Chinese but propaganda uh, machine. But there's also overwhelming evidence that this is uh, that all of this is happening. Would you also mention the fact that there, like, there's many independent sources that are not uh, that seem to be matching about the, uh, what's happening there, and that's 
Uh, that's how you know that this is true, the, the amount of overwhelming evidence that, that exists for this from independent sources? Yeah, uh, all of the information that I have shared with you, uh, either from independently verified uh, or based on the Chinese government's own open source information or uh, recently leaked government top secret documents that was that were released through New York Times last November and IJ, uh, I, uh, International uh, uh, Investigative Journalism Consortium. So, and also on top of that, we have um, a significant number of uh, Uyghur victims uh, and survivors have provided their personal testimonies, including those who have been subject to sexual violence in the camps. Uh, a, a Uyghur woman uh, here in Washington, D.C. married a Pakistani uh, gentleman uh, with kids uh, testified, uh, told the reporters that she she is no longer can conceive a baby because of this uh, uh, mysterious pill that she was given during her incarceration. And also uh, another Uyghur woman who was here in the United States um, uh, who also spent uh, a time in the concentration camp told uh, U.S. Congress during her testimony that the Uyghur women were given uh, mysterious pills that made them less emotional um, uh, and also affecting their monthly ministrals. So, and also on top of these, um, we have um, a, um, a recently um, a disclosed uh, a document that shows that Chinese government uh, through repressive policies for sterilization prevented Uyghur population growth from 2015 to 2018 by 84 uh, percent wow. compared to the previous year, 24 uh, percent. Um, so that in of itself uh, speaks volume. So if any government, any entity, any individuals uh, purposefully, deliberately uh, use a forcible message uh, such as this one, to prevent population growth, that uh, goes to the heart of the uh, definition for culture, uh, genocide. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, there are about half a million Uyghur babies uh, been taken away, either uh, from their grandparents uh, after, the, after their parents taken into the concentration camp or forcibly removed from their family to uh, send to this uh, human reengineering programs. Uh, this American Life recently interviewed a Turkey-based father who recognized his son uh, through the uh, Chinese propaganda materials promoting the state-run orphanages. This is, okay, so this is obviously, it's it's shocking, especially to hear you talk about it. And we've read about some of these things in the news and it's, it's doubly shocking to hear. But one of the things that there was a, uh, an international tribunal in London and over the last year, there have been reports of China killing prisoners, including uh, Uyghur Muslims, and harvesting their organs, like officially actually doing that. And so it seems like there is evidence of it, but um, is this something that you've heard and that you know about? Um, organ harvesting has been a practice uh, in China for uh, years. Uh, I believe this started with the Falun Gong practitioners. Right. Uh, and then uh, uh, expand it to other groups based on the reliable information and personal accounts that we have uh, through uh, investigative uh, uh, research and documentation. Uh, UK-based two scholars, uh, doctors, uh, written books, published reports, and testified in various uh, parliamentar parliaments, including our own Congress, that. Uh, Chinese government has been actively engaging in organ harvesting. Uh, last summer, I spoke at a, uh, a Washington think tank. One of my co-panelists uh, was uh, telling the audience a telling uh, information, which is the wait time for um, organ uh, donor uh, uh, has shortened significantly. These days, even it does not take more than 48 hours. So that, that uh, uh, that kind of uh, information, uh, and this person is not a loose talker. Um, and also, um, we have seen the video, and this is also Googleable, publicly available information. Some hospitals in, in Beijing uh, promoting uh, 
uh, organ transplant to Eng uh, Arabic speaking patients. And their, their promotional video have been circulated. Uh, I'm sure it's still available on YouTube unless the government find it to be, Chinese government find it to be harmful and, and uh, they've removed it. Uh, and also uh, uh, there, there's some images being circulated. Um, uh, uh, it's sign on the airport uh, floor uh, stating that there's a fast track uh, uh, transfer of organs uh, to getting from point A to point B. Um, this is one of the very difficult issues to um, ascertain a specific actual information, but um, the, the, uh, I can't say that um, uh, there's a, a promotional uh, effort for halal organs, but uh, Uyghur uh, individuals who have been uh, either sent to the prison or sent to the concentration camp are not leaving. Uh, Chinese authorities also based on the Radio Free Asia reporting in summer 2018, were actively recruiting uh, workers to work at um, crematorium around the camps. So why would they build that many uh, crematoria? Why would, they, uh, why would they not releasing anyone? Why would a, a Chinese security official uh, tells reporter in the recent frontline documentary that uh, people have gone mad? Uh, if they've been released to the society, they will become social criminals. Therefore, uh, the Chinese government need to build a large uh, mental hospitals. So, um, you know, when you, uh, when you take someone in, uh, especially uh, pious people uh, who have uh, been living a very spiritual life, and forcing them to uh, eat pork against their will, subjecting them to um, uh, uh, sexual violence, and uh, separating them from their children, their family, and and, and sending uh, former university professors to work in assembly line, that can break you. Mm -hmm. That can easily break you, and this under uh, malnutrition, uh, substandard, uh, poor living condition, uh, as described by the United States Congress, uh, helping uh, the Chinese profiteer uh, to make money uh, and send those products around the world uh, by using uh, enslaved Uyghurs uh, can break you. Yeah. So this, this the attack on the Uyghur identity, Uyghur uh, uh, the way of life, Uyghur families uh, uh, should shock the conscience of the international community, but we have not seen a strong policy responses. The Chinese government, um, uh, the uh, there is a reporter uh, who is now with uh, with New York Times. His name is Ben Dolly. He wrote uh, for AFP um, a couple of years ago that has a, a couple of chilling uh, quotes. One is uh, when was asked about the purpose of building these camps, uh, a Chinese top Chinese official said that the purpose of these camps to break the uh, connection, break the roots, break the lineage of the Uyghur people. And also, um, and, and when they asked about uh, about the nature of the camps, uh, he said that these camps should teach like a school, uh, be managed like the prison, and protected like a military. So uh, the, uh, the the purpose, uh, uh, the intention are there uh, clearly. In criminal law, uh, as you may know, um, there is a concept called actus rea and mens rea. Uh, actus rea is the action, right. is the intention. So uh, when you look at the, um, the actions being reported, and, and the intentions being deliberated and uh, stated publicly, it goes hand in hand that there's a crime against humanity being committed against Uyghur people. Um, the um, specific intent uh, uh, that the Chinese government has shown also being reported in the uh, leaked documents. Uh, one of those four individuals who had been subject to uh, global Magnitsky sanction uh, uh, as part of the decision early this month, uh, signed up that manual that specifically said that you should never allow anyone to be released or escaped. John Oliver just did a show on this uh, a few days ago, and he's mm -hmm. really focused on that. If it's a re-education camp, it, if it's like a free come and go, why would you afraid of somebody being uh, escaped? Uh, yeah. So um, this is not a, you know, I, I, I like to challenge those people who claim to care about somebody's right or his own right. 
uh, or very skeptical about certain issues and, and consider himself as a fighter for social injustice. I mean, look at this. If never again is just a, a, lip, a lip service to some people, is a nice uh, slogan to repeat yourself without even <laughs> looking at it carefully. Uh, you can leave, uh, put aside everything political. Uh, you can you can criticize this government, that government, uh, domestically or elsewhere. But just the fact that somebody is being really uh, punished in modern day concentration camps, uh, being subject to forced labor, uh, uh, based on that person's ethnicity, uh, religious belief, then we have a problem. If you don't see a problem in that, then I think there's there, there's a problem with you. Yeah, I, 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 I can be as blunt as I am uh, right now. So I, it, it is. It, there's no controversy. Even take a side. The the yeah. silence in 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 some societies and some governments where some well, some people in power is unconscionable. They just exactly what uh, oppressors and authoritarian regime dictatorship wants you to do. You you drew comparisons to you've drawn parallels with Nazi Germany, and you've drawn actually not just spurious parallels, but you've uh, uh, you know you've talked about the similarities between what's happening here and uh, what happened in World War II in Nazi Germany, uh, and we we always say never forget, never again. Yet uh, this is happening again. Can you talk about some of those uh, parallels or some of the things that you have seen? And we've already talked about several of them. I mean. Yeah, um, first of all, the concentration camp concept. Uh, apparently, the Chinese uh, policy experts, uh, the thought leaders who advise the, uh, current, uh, the, occupant, occupant, uh, the current Chinese super leader, uh, supreme leader, uh, studied a lot how uh, uh, the historic concentration camps um, uh, uh, forcibly going through uh, uh, certain ethnic group to social engineering, human engineering work that, uh, and parts did not work. So when you listen to the rhetoric, uh, the language that they use, a uh, few things jumps out at you. One, um, the some of the Chinese policy uh, uh, experts use the term final solution. Of course, they use the, the term such as uh, final solution to the Xinjiang problem. There is no Xinjiang problem. To them, Xinjiang problem is the Uyghur problem. So what do they have in mind and where do they pick up that the language? Uh, final solution is not a part of uh, everyday Chinese language. It's not a part of everyday Central Asian Turkic language. It's not part of even any language. Why would they pick up a final solution concept? That, that, that to me is very concerning. Number one. Number two, um, when they initially uh, looked at the type of people that they are rounding up, uh, which is very similar to the way that Nazi Germany rounded up. Nazi Germany went up to the bankers, the educators, scientists, you know, social elites. Exactly the same of rounding up uh, took place. As we speak, we, um, we're we looking for a president of Xinjiang University, uh, a well-known uh, scholar who has P two PhDs, uh, one from France, from, from, one from uh, Japan. And we're also uh, looking for former president of Xinjiang Medical University. We were looking for uh, a... a well-known Islamic scholar who translated Quran from Arabic to Uyghur, who apparently died in prison um, in the camp. Even uh, he was 80, uh, over 80 year old, a harmless person to anyone, never committed any crime. So they took away um, or took a detained uh, Uyghur social elites, uh, the custodian of Uyghur cultural heritage, scientists, thought leaders, just like the way that Nazi Germany did. And then uh, three, they build a massive camps. Uh, some of these camps are uh, uh, multiple sides of the soccer field. Uh, uh, BBC has this uh, uh, graphic image uh, on their website uh, from 2000, late 2018. It shows the process of building these camps. China has become the world's largest jailer. Uh, recently, one of the Chinese said that um, in a video, uh, in, in a propaganda video, that uh, Xinjiang has become the safest place in the world. So, if you build that many camps, of course, it will what you get. Wow. Uh, mm -hmm. And also, um, another similarities: um, they used uh, women um, uh, to build uh, to set up the initial camps, which is also uh, similar to the Nazi camps. And finally, uh, when they rounded up these individuals. Uh, like much like the Nazi uh, concentration camps in Dachau and, and uh, Auschwitz, uh, people generally did not know uh, why they're in the camp. 
other than them being Jew or uh, gypsies. It's very yeah. similar. So, and then religious background. So, um, uh, you know, when you look at the historic concentration camp uh, uh, commonalities, uh, sometimes you see some political aspect to it. But oftentimes, uh, one of the hallmarks of concentration camps that the, uh, the, uh, the ones that uh, Nazi Germany used to exterminate Jews and the ones that the China had and the Stalin's gulag, even Japanese internment camps have several things in common. One, those camps always set up and detain individuals based on their ethnicity or religious background. Two, uh, when they uh, detain, uh, vast majority of them don't know why they detained. Uh, three, once they're in the camp, they don't know when they will be released. Four, even if they're released, they never uh, been told or explained why they've been taken to the camp in the first place. And finally, even if they manage to leave the camp uh, in one piece uh, uh, safely, they never compensated for the detention. So uh, when you look at um, the, uh, the Chinese camps versus the historic camps that we read in the books, uh, share several striking uh, commonalities. So I, I initially I was very comfortable uh, because I did my own uh, due diligence, uh, reading, studying, uh, find several commonalities. But uh, last November, uh, when New, New York Times released the secret documents, uh, a few uh, wording jumped out at me. One, the Chinese it, themselves use the term ji uh, zhong, uh, which is uh, collective or concentrate. Uh, so they had concentration in mind. Uh, and also, um, when you look at the way that they describe these camps, uh, uh, they use the term transformation. Uh, from the time of the camps came to surface in the media, uh, in our public discussion, uh, till uh, to this day, they have changed the name nine times. Of those nine times, seven of the names that they use um, includes transformation. Transformation is a code word for social engineering and human engineering under the communist uh, system. In, in communism, if you believe in religion or if you don't believe in religion, or if you appear to be different, or if you pose any type of threat by being different, that in of itself could subject you for transformation. The Chinese ambassador to Washington uh, by the name Su Tianke, people should pay attention to it. Apparently American media loved to talk to him. Uh, recently, Farid Zakari on CNN GPS talked to him. Uh, Politico uh, published his op-ed. Uh, he has a verified Twitter account. Uh, he told public uh, comfortably, get used to it. Uh, you have to learn how to deal with the, the China that you know today, number one. Number two, uh, his government is helping the Uyghur people to transfer, uh, transform into a normal human being. So in 2020, um, I did not know um, that the Chinese uh, communist government decides who's normal, who's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Armin. Okay, so, yeah, I just wanted to mention, I ask, um, there seems to be a level of hypocrisy. Like, we have been talking about this um, for a couple of years right now, and it hasn't, for, for a while, it didn't seem to get much traction. Recently, it's getting a lot more attention. But even throughout this time, uh, one thing at first we noticed is that countries like Iran, Pakistan, or Saudi Arabia, at first they weren't bringing attention to any of this, which was strange to us given that they constantly talk about how Israel and United States are um, and, uh, oppressing Muslims. But this, this seemed to be like astronomically higher level of um, um, oppression of Muslims in, in, some, in levels that is not even comparable. And at first they weren't saying anything about it. And we, we thought they were being hypocrites because of the deals that they have with China. But then they went one step beyond not saying anything about it. They actually released a letter not only approving of what China was doing against Muslims, these Muslim countries, but also congratulating them for their anti-terrorist methods. Um, what are your views on that? And um, how, how could how could uh, you explain such a, level of it hypocrisy? It is unconscionable uh, for these countries, as you perfectly pointed out, um, that uh, they become uh, they chose to become a straight bedfellow with a government uh, with ideology. Uh, uh, there's no tolerance in communism for any religion. It's a religion in of itself. Uh, 
So uh, it is it is mind boggling to say the least that they are not only becoming a strange bed, strange bedfellow with uh, the communist brothers uh, uh, brothers in Beijing, but also coming on in defense of these uh, policies. Um, MBS, uh, who's groomed to be the uh, next custodian of the two holiest mosque for the Muslim people. Um, it's 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 amazing that we're having this conversation on a uh, an important religious holiday for the uh, Muslim people. That yeah. he goes to Beijing, uh, not only goes business as usual with with uh, Xi Jinping, uh, and and knowing the fact that his name Mohammed is banned, knowing that uh, the some of the Islamic names like uh, Ali, Yaqub, Jack, uh, Fatima, are banned. And knowing that uh, his way of greeting people, as alaykum, can be seen as a sign of uh, extremist. And also his way of uh, dressing up, his way of refusing to eat pork. Like everything that he embodies in, in his body, in his uh, religious teaching, uh, <laughs> if there's any, uh, just goes against what the Chinese are doing. And, and, and the most ironic part of this whole thing is that... Um, uh, the Chinese uh, have been calling the Uyghur Islam as a mental illness. Um, and the Uyghurs believing in ethno-national tradition, uh, spiritual life as a thought virus. We live in a virus world and, and just, just it's, it, it is incredible that the China calls somebody's religious practices or spiritual life as a, uh, a virus. And now we're dealing with um, even bigger virus around the world today. So um, I named uh, specifically Saudi Arabia, um, and also I'm very uh, uh, I'm very disappointed that uh, the Ayatollahs in Iran, uh, Imran Khan in Pakistan, in Pakistan yeah. uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan in Turkey, uh, and others, LCC in Egypt, everyone um, is, you know, either um, knowingly or by force uh, 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 to become a Chinese clientile. clientile uh, clientile state uh, doing China's dirty work. Uh, Turkey is a different case. Uh, Turkey has been um, uh, a home to Uyghur diaspora community and they've been welcoming some uh, Uyghur refugees. They mildly criticize the Chinese policies, but the Erdogan uh, himself, president uh, of, of Turkey, uh, uh, publicly said that they, what is happening to Uyghurs is a kind of a genocide in 2009, like 11 years ago. So uh, his silence is mind-boggling. And also Pakistan is another interesting case. There are about um, at least three, four dozen of uh, Pakistani individuals who are looking for their wives who have disappeared in the concentration camp. And Imran Khan publicly denies uh, not only once, twice at least that he does not know anything about these camps. And also Ministry of Human Rights for Pakistan denied uh, uh, having any knowledge when uh, she was interviewed by uh, Mahdi Hassan on Al Jazeera. And also um, the Iranian president uh, never mentions the word. So uh, the hypocr on top of hypocrisy, they also, um, the, uh, some of their public statements and public positions that they've taken uh, suggest that they are uh, using the, this against the United States, as if that the United States or uh, Canada or U.S. allies are creating this problem uh, uh, intentionally, like uh, you know, back in old days in the uh, in a, throughout history in Central Asia and Europe, Eastern and Western Europe. Um, so, you know, this, as I pointed out earlier, this should be quite easy matter for Muslim countries to take a position, they should be feel, I, I, you know, I am, uh, I don't miss word. They should be feel embarrassed that the, uh, the, the Jewish communities and Christian communities coming out in defense of the, uh, their religion while they are being a strange bedfellow with communist leadership in Beijing. Well, atheist communities as well, um, but um, and, and not of the religion, of the right to practice their religion. I, I do want to make that clear because we are also like, um, I don't think, I think it's important to get the wording right. I, I, I don't think it's the, the problem is that toler China is not being tolerant of a religion. I think it, China is not being tolerant of people's right to practice a religion uh, because we also describe that we are not tolerant of 
bad ideas like religion as well here. But when we say we're not tolerant of it, we mean that what we mean is that we challenge them by arguing against them and you know criticizing it. I think the tolerance that is not accept the intolerance that is not acceptable is to take people's freedom to practice their religion or express their ideas. So it's mostly about the oppression of the people of the Muslims. I think we think here it's okay to be anti-Islam, but it's not okay to be anti-Muslim. That's the difference that we want to yeah, emphasize. I, recently, I, I, I agree with that. I, I recently attended a major speech by Secretary of State. Um, he said that uh, the Declaration of Independence is the uh, the oldest human rights document. Uh, he specifically focuses on uh, religious freedom in the context of people's right to believe in the religion and not to believe in the religion. Uh, so, uh, to me, uh, you know, my commission also uh, promotes, protects people's right to believe in a religion and not to believe in any religion. So that, and to criticize religion. Yeah, also that should be, uh, you know, the religion is, uh, is individual choice. Uh, no government, no one should be interfering. It's your choice. It's your belief. Uh, I, uh, even before I took up this official role, I have always been telling people that anytime the government intrudes, your privacy, uh, whether you, um, you know, uh, uh, wanted to bring or not to bring a child to this world, or if you worship one God over another or not to worship on any God. So that is a personal choice. But the problem with China is that they're forcing uh, uh, people uh, in the Christian community, the Uyghur Muslim community to embrace uh, Xi Jinping ideology as a, as a religion, basically. Yeah. So Xi Jinping thoughts is a new religion in China. If you go to the churches, um, I just testified yesterday on this very particular issue uh, uh, at the uh, Tom Nantos Human Rights Commission. Uh, the, the Uyghurs, along with other religious minorities, also have been subject. The problem is the communist ideology, communist uh, system. Uh, if I borrow, if I may borrow uh, Secretary Pompeo's famous line uh, the other day at the Nixon Library, that the Chinese government has been lying to uh, 1.4 billion of its own citizens every day. So yeah. they, that 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 kind of uh, you know, they, communism. I'm I'm a I'm an anti-communist person uh, because I lived through it and I know it and the menace nature of it. And I, uh, I I I I I was educated in the communist system. Um, it, it's quite fascinating that from a communist education system uh, to a law school in the United States, quite the transition. So um, I, I know I, I I lived through it. So I, I uh, there's no uh, love lost between me and the communist ideology. But I think I think the problem uh, with 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 the Chinese way of uh, dealing with people of faith or no faith is that they forcing uh, the communism as their religion for them. I think that's a huge problem. You've uh, you've talked about concerns, and this is something that um, I took me by surprise, is that you were talking about the surveillance system that China has, yeah. and especially with the time of this pandemic and when they're trying to do contact tracing, uh, that there are other countries that have actually adopted it, and you were very concerned about this. Can you can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I... Uh, I you know, uh, people think uh, generally, one of the reasons, if I step back, uh, one of the reasons that China has been able to get away with its crime against the Uyghurs and others is because people feel indifferent about what's happening. Oh, this is not a human rights problem. Uh, we have too much to worry about. Now we have a public health crisis. Uh, people even more focus on their own country, on society, on family, rightfully so. But... Um, the the uh, one of the uh, under discussed almost untold aspect of China's uh, repression of the Uyghurs entails uh, high tech surveillance. Um, people right. sometimes say Holocaust 2.0. Um, out of respect to the uh, Jewish people, I try not to use the Holocaust as a comparison. I think they they earned that uh, word by sacrificing six million of their people. What I can say is that um, um, what the Chinese has set up is a uh, East German Stasi with a uh, clotting system, high clot, algorithm, mm -hmm. surveillance machines, uh, security cameras, uh, iris scan capabilities, um, 
biometric data collection capabilities. Uh, recently, I appeared in a, a frontline um, documentary called uh, The Age of AI. One of the individuals who spoke uh, like in China is the new Air Saudi Arabia for personal data. Uh, so, uh, and not only they have collected a massive number of personal data, they also developed very sophisticated um, surveillance system. Uh, as we speak, um, I recently participated in a hearing that my, uh, my commission organized. One of the uh, testimonies, um, uh, uh, one of the witnesses uh, told us that over 80 countries have adopted China's surveillance technology. So this no longer is an issue, um, only matters to the Uyghur people who have been subject to China's uh, genocidal policies. It, it, in the end, this will affect the lives of everyone. Uh, as we speak today, mm -hmm. even in the United States and North America, particularly in Canada, there's a name called Huawei, uh, is in the news a lot. And this company, yep. this entity, is one of the main tools that the Chinese authorities are using, along with ZTE, Hikvision, FaceTime, and now the TikTok, uh, uh, WeChat, to expand uh, their technological advantage, advantages to gradually come into the lives of the people and, and become part of their pockets. Because many, many countries around the world um, already adopted Chinese identification system that can trace you, that, that they can keep track of your political um, uh, uh, affiliation, that will keep track of your voting records, that will keep track of your spending, that will keep track of your uh, travel history. So the, no effort, no more um, like a biometric data collection uh, that has been part of our lives post 9-11, uh, that we willfully give fingerprints. There's nothing is required, it's in your pocket. Yeah, and the it's, pandemic, it's actually, and, and sorry, sorry, just one question, uh, not a question, a comment. The pandemic has given them an excuse for it. Yes, uh, when you look at um, it, it, it is almost um, heartbreaking that some countries uh, 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 pampering China for providing uh, PPEs. Uh, I mentioned about the forced, forced labor nature of the PPE production. And also some countries are uh, mistakenly admiring China's way of handling the pandemic. Uh, massive lock lockdown, uh, contact tracing. I worry that if those countries uh, that are warming up to the idea of uh, adopting China's contact tracing for the purposes of the ongoing pandemic, that may become permanent. The, the system that the China put in place, the contact tracing, we recently been told that the hearing that I was referring uh, earlier have become permanent. So this will be a new, new trend. So when the lives at stake, people generally don't worry about, you know, they've been traced. Uh, they, they may say, okay, as long as I'm safe, as long as I'm healthy, um, it's okay. But what will happen after the, uh, uh, the, uh, the crisis has been managed is something that should give us a pause when we talk about. If you want to really talk about success, look at Taiwan and South Korea. Taiwan is also a Chinese-speaking country, a tiny country. When you look at the number of uh, uh, cases and death, it's it's almost very, very small. Uh, we're talking about 40 to 50 people in a whole 25 million uh, people island. So um, if anyone wanted to admire <laughs> uh, or have a second thought about their relationship with communist China. Look at the way that they handle the crisis. Uh, look at the way that they, uh, who covered up, who managed it, who has been transparent. Uh, so Taiwan and the uh, PRC uh, is a really good comparison to compare and and and, and choose the method that may work and uh, for the benefit of the country and citizens in the long run. Um, when it comes to actually Iran, the, it's very ironic that. China is using this surveillance technology uh, to f uh, to find people who have Islamic beliefs, and at the same time, it's helping Iran. It's giving Iran the technology um, to fight people who have anti-Islamic views, <laughs> which is like completely like um, and, and not just anti-Islamic views, but anything against the government as well. Um, and Iran has been using Chinese technology to to fight dissent. Um, for a while now, 
But now, even more recently, China and Iran are getting closer with each other because of the U.S. sanctions and Iran trying to rely on uh, China as an alternative way to do trades and everything. Uh, just recently, there was um, a giant deal uh, being um, agreed on between China and Iran, and it's bringing the countries closer to together. And I Iran is even letting Chinese officials and government staff to come into Iran and manage things. Um, which is, as somebody who is an activist when it comes to uh, Iranian rights um, against an Islamic theocracy, um, it's very. It, I can, I, I can tell you, like on the ground, is looking more and more. Um, you know, the situation is getting worse and worse because of China's involvement and support of uh, uh, and the support of Islamic Republic. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I hope I'm not sounding like an alarmist. But I like to sound alarm uh, to those countries uh, in the developing uh, uh, world, uh, namely uh, several uh, large Muslim countries that have become a um, uh, strange, bent, strange bedfellow with uh, communist Chinese regime. Uh, it, the, you know, there's a saying in the Uyghur history that Chinese uh, comes with the flowers and sweet words, and, and the next thing you notice is they take over your life. So um, with the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, with the large economic incentives that the um, Communist China has been given to countries like Pakistan, uh, UAE, uh, Iran, uh, uh, comes with a price in the end. Uh, it's not only the boot trap, uh, the, uh, uh, but it is a... Uh, China's long-term objectives um, to take over. Like, look at the uh, the port situation in Sri Lanka. They give you the loan; uh, you will not be able to pay back, and then they will claim ownership. So, this has been a part of their model. Uh, recently, a thoughtful foreign policy expert uh, written about China's aggressive diplomatic efforts, uh, wolf diplomacy. Uh, 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 described in a very uh, thoughtful way uh, in the foreign affairs magazine. I invited you to take a look at it to make sense, uh, to get a sense of how they've been engaged. So, um, yeah, it's okay to be alarmist, but we should be alarmed. Uh, they are not as harmless, as innocuous power as they try to project themselves. Um, and look at what's happening in Africa. Uh, look what's happening in Central Asia. Uh, the countries cannot even function without Chinese pressure. The Human Rights Council today, uh, UN operations, um, uh, literally heavily influenced. Um, I, I don't want to get into the domestic politics, but there's a reason, there's some valid reason for the United States of, of being uh, critical of World Health Organization. The, yeah. um, when you look at the Human Rights Council, uh, that has become a tool for countries like Iran, uh, like Saudi Arabia and China, Cuba, Venezuela, to beat up <laughs> Western democracies. It's almost a joke. Uh, it sounds like a bad joke when uh, when when China, Cuba, uh, Pakistan, and and you know uh, some countries uh, with a, a dismal a dismal human rights record trying to run the Human Rights Council, and also the UN. It is also another. Um, uh, this is part of the U.S. government's position uh, that the United Nations is failing to fulfill its obligation. Human rights work, uh, human rights uh, campaign, human rights protection, uh, looking into um, uh, the crimes uh, is being committed against Uyghurs uh, and taking action. If it's genocide, it's the UN, a part of the U.N. mandate. And they have been, they have been dead quiet. Yeah. Why is that? It's Chinese money. They pay a big chunk of uh, UN operations. Right. I, I wanted to get to this, obviously, because you know we have a little bit of time left, but I really want to know um, your view on this. Right now, there, as Armin mentioned, there is a lot more attention on China. A lot of that is because of the pandemic. You've worked with the Bush administration, the Obama, and, and now the Trump administration. Um, recently, the, you know, the, the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act was passed. Yes. Um, before this, I, I, you know, as you you mentioned earlier, that you've been trying to talk about this and bring attention to it, and it wasn't happening. Uh, now it's actually happening. Now, whether the intentions of the administrations, you know, whether those are questionable, but I, I, how do you think it should go for he, from here? Are you encouraged? Um, and what do you think the rest of us can actually do to help this along? 
three things uh, should have happened, and now we're seeing uh, starting to happen. Uh, one is to call China out for what it is. Uh, you know, we talked about this is being non-controversial. It's a matter of conscience in the beginning of our conversation. Um, anyone who is not taking position in a way uh, complicit uh, in this crime, uh, their silence, their tiptoeing around is uh, giving courage to the Chinese authorities, number one. So we need to call them out. There should be uh, global condemnation on individual level, governmental level, uh, either individually or collectively. And number two, um, uh, the China's, uh, the, the various countries' economic relationship um, need to be revisited. Business as usual cannot be continued. Um, I'll give you another example. Uh, this is also um, related to this topic. Volkswagen being a, a company with a horrible history uh, most recently yeah. being uh, uh, hit with a huge fine for cheating on EPA standards, right? Operates a, uh, a plant in Rimji. The Volkswagen CEO uh, feigned I ignorance. Uh, and also this was part of the John Oliver show the other day. Uh, yeah. German government uh, has not taken a position yet, which is, you know, like... Look, when you flip through the history, we'll see we see you easily, and now you're not taking a position that's unconscionable. But to German government's uh, credit, they have done some of the small things. For example, they joined the uh, 22 Western country letter. They co-hosted um, a side event last year during the uh, uh, United Nations uh, General Assembly meeting, uh, and their ambassador in Beijing joined the effort to uh, demand access to the region. Small things. But uh, bigger things could happen and should happen. So, so the, the global uh, coalition effort need to be built because the boat is too small to tackle a China threat. Uh, it, we need bigger boat. And this would also minimize uh, damages uh, to a, an individual country's relationship with China. If it's a collective effort, that would, would, would be much more effective. And finally, we, I briefly mentioned the economic interest. Uh, this is the, the corporate uh, uh, world. Uh, we're talking about 80, more than 80 companies, uh, the global companies, like global brands, been in, uh, complicit in this matter. Uh, a few days ago, when the tech giants came to uh, testify at the U.S. Congress, um, I was disheartened by uh, Tim Cook's uh, kind of a half um, uh, have true statement about the uh, uh, forced labor. Uh, some people, um, some of those tech giants, uh, uh, explicitly said that there's no room for forced labor, but some of them were not very very clear. So the 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 global um, uh, business community uh, have to take a position. And finally, you know, we live in democracy. You know, our uh, representatives uh, in various parliaments and the uh, Congress uh, are elected by us. So if you can activate citizens to demand uh, their parliamentarians, demand their governments, for example, in Canada, why Canada is not imposing global Magnitsky sanction uh, against the Chinese human rights abusers? Uh, 2006, a Canadian Uyghur uh, was taken uh, back to China from Uzbekistan. His name is Hussein Jilil, uh, uh, and he disappeared. And the next thing we know, uh, we know or heard, is the Chinese imposed uh, a life sentence in this guy. So mm -hmm. um, maybe you know, uh, people can uh, can uh, reasonable people could disagree. But if Hussein Jilil's case was properly handled. We may not have two Michael uh, being detained in the daylight in the Chinese prison. So the, the countries like UK, Canada have to utilize uh, the legal tools that is very similar to Global Magnitsky uh, Act in the United States to go after those human rights abusers. So this is something that the citizens of those three countries could do, demanding the government to, uh, to uh, respond uh, legislatively and, and, and through executive decision. And then... Um, the other thing that I, I, I like to see the citizen activists to do is to boycott uh, any product, uh, the cotton uh, textile products, uh, even, 
you know, uh, brand names that uh, easily find and I can help you to come up with the list. It's easy. If you uh, just uh, type uh, 80 companies being impl uh, uh, implicated in the forced labor in Xinjiang, uh, the list will come up. Uh, so I, I don't want to bore you with all the 80 names, but they're all of the brand names, big names, uh, closing. Uh, that includes Hugo Boss, H&M, uh, Unique Law. Uh, you, will, you will find it. So you need yeah. to stop buying those products. Even if you see a, a, a textile or cotton product, it says made in China. I can guarantee you that it, it, it is highly likely that it's been made by forced labor, uh, the Uyghur, uh, uh, modern day slaves in the Uyghur region. 84% of the cotton products produced, uh, sold, exported in China are sourced in Xinjiang. To more than 20% uh, of the uh, world's cotton supply uh, were uh, from that region. So you have pretty decent chance of touching or buying uh, products produced by uh, enslaved Uyghurs in your stores. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what you could do. And then finally, uh, you know, raising awareness uh, and be very skeptical about people who are trying to mix this uh, humanitarian crisis with political issues. Um, is there any political component to it? Absolutely. Is this some, uh, some country stirring up a geopolitical struggle against another country? Uh, I would say no. Uh, is there any active genocide that's taking place? Absolutely. Uh, if, if never again mean anything to you, should you take a position? Absolutely. Is there anything that you can do to help? Yes. There are a number of things that you can do, including, uh, you know, as small as just using the social media. There's a uh, um, Afghani American girl in New Jersey. Uh, she used a TikTok last year. There are millions of people of you. Then she became a celebrity. The eyelashes one, right? Eyelash one. And, and a couple of days ago, recently, another girl cried uh, in, in social media asking people to pay attention. So, you know, there's a lot of things that can be done. Uh, awakening, uh, recognizing, uh, being skeptical about, and this is also. Please understand, this has nothing to do with counterterrorism. Mm -hmm. You don't fight terrorism by locking up nearly twenty percent of the population in the modern day concentration camps. That's not what you do. Mm -hmm. Um, I know you only said you had one hour, but uh, you answered a lot of the questions that people ask already. But is, do you have time for just two questions from the live chat? Just two questions? Yes. Okay. All right. So one of the questions was about, uh, uh, given that you're part of the um, commission on U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, uh, do, you, do you also work on uh, Christians' rights in China and also in countries like Saudi Arabia and the fact that uh, China is also... Uh, oppressing the the Christians there? Yeah. The USURF is an acronym for uh, the United States uh, Commission on International Religious Freedom. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we are established uh, under the mandate, uh, legislative mandate of 1998 with the Statute of International Religious Freedom Act. Um, uh, our, our responsibility is to monitor religious freedom, religious persecution around the world and make a recommendation to the United States uh, government, and namely President, Secretary of State, and Congress. Uh, my responsibility specifically entails um, all of the religious minorities in China. Uh, I monitor, uh, speak, uh, make recommendations uh, uh, on religious persecution uh, mm -hmm. to ensure that uh, religious freedom issues uh, are part of, integral part of the US foreign policy agenda. In addition to China, I also monitor um, religious freedom uh, uh, in uh, Eurasia, uh, specifically in former Soviet uh, republics, all the stands, uh, all the way from Kazakhstan to Azerbaijan. I also uh, uh, participate in a discussion uh, monitoring uh, of religious freedom issues in the Middle East. Um, Ali, do you want to read this? This is the last question. Do you want to read this one? Yes, this is from uh, Nissan Tara Rising. Um, she's saying, or he's saying, uh, what can be done to prevent the Uyghur cause from being hijacked by uh, Islamists or pan-Turkic tourists? Uh, the 2015 Thai-Turkic bombing really discredited the Uyghurs in Thailand. Well, that's a, it's a great question. Um, if, if the majority, the people um, uh, with a clear objective, uh, uh, 
from a, a humanitarian point of view, uh, people definitely will hijack it. Uh, I am not worried too much about uh, individuals uh, with certain ideology to hijack it. I'm more worried about uh, some government entities uh, doing something to divert the attention uh, or come up with uh, like a sim simple response as like I told you so. Uh, you bunch of fools, uh, they are uh, bad people type of reaction. It worked in the history and it, it, it may work again. Um, China is a powerful country. Uh, they're not short of money, uh, resources, manpower. Uh, and oftentimes when they do say stuff in public, um, I don't think that uh, shame is part of their consideration. Uh, recently, the... Uh, 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 Chinese ambassador to UK uh, said a bunch of um, uh, uh, lies that he cannot even properly uh, perform. He was told to lie, but he could not even do it. So, um, and and they they're capable of doing a lot of horrible things, uh, including to uh, uh, by design divert the public attention. So, you know, one bad apple <laughs> can uh, can destroy. Uh, a basketball good apple. So I worry that um, a, a certain governments or a regime may uh, uh, do something to uh, divert the attention. But I, at the same time, I worry that some fringe groups uh, may take advantage of it. But I think this issue has become uh, big enough um, receiving uh, enough uh, support from fair-minded people to uh, say, you know, yeah, you can try, but I think this is a different matter to handle. So I, I'm not worried too much about uh, fringe groups. I think their marketability is quite low. What what if one tactic might be to get in uh, whenever these fringe groups uh, try to like uh, are in danger of hijacking the movement or uh, diverting attention from it is my, one strategy might be to get in front of China Chinese, the Chinese government, and instead, before they misuse it for their own uh, human rights violation, the people that are on the side of supporting the Uyghur Muslims to um, to call it out as something that they, you know, instead of ignoring it and pretending like it's not happened, even if it's fringe, get ahead of the Chinese government and call it out as something that is wrong before the Chinese government even does that. So that yeah. might be a threat. Yeah. Yes, and also um, that's that's a great point. Um, um, you know the the Chinese government has a, a, a very um, uh, uh, I, I, I'm hesitant to use the word effective. Uh, they've been quite effective in uh, just ignoring all the denunciation. You know, uh, clear uh, positions being put out by Uyghur groups. I can't think of any Uyghur organizations uh, around the world, um, especially in the. Um, uh, the, the uh, free societies um, in Europe, North America, elsewhere, uh, have not had a chance to condemn uh, violence. Uh, there's a, a organization based in Munich that the Chinese government oftentimes accuses of, uh, uh, you know, with this popular name, terrorist organization, is actually uh, supported by the United States Congress uh, through the National Endowment for Democracy to uh, engage in organizing leadership training projects. Uh, the name of the organization is World Group Congress. Um, the World Group Congress uh, publicly condemned uh, violence multiple times. Their website, their mission statement uh, clearly states that in the last uh, June, the organization received a democracy award. <laughs> And um, and the vice uh, the president of the uh, organization serves as the vice president of UNPO, uh, Unrepresented Nations People's Organization, based in Europe, and he travels around the world. Uh, on the, so there's there's a lot of uh, uh, a, um, a malicious intention by the Chinese government to discredit uh, Uyghur organizations, despite the fact that these organizations says that. They against any type of violence, whatever the reason, uh, 15 times on every single occasion. So uh, I think the the uh, much to uh, fair-minded people's credit, um, uh, se several governments' credit, uh, the the effort actively being <laughs> promoted uh, uh, by the Chinese authorities have not been really effective in that regard. But there are a lot of uh, ignorant people, uh, especially in certain streets, uh, buy into that. Um, uh, propaganda 
uh, and also uh, we have to acknowledge that that there were some uh, violent incidents uh, during the period of 2012 through 15. Uh, I, 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 I've read about it, I've heard enough, but uh, to this day, uh, no independent entity, a journalist, or uh, a reasonable government representative has verified those allegations by the Chinese government. Uh, violence is not uh, acceptable for whatever the reason. Uh, we condemn, uh, uh, we mean, as a Uyghur uh, myself, um, there has been a very clear message around the world. You know, just being a Muslim uh, makes you vulnerable. It's difficult. Uh, and, and the Chinese propaganda has been effective, but you have to keep saying it. <laughs> yeah, you do. Uh, Nuri, thank you so much for being so generous uh, you. with your time. This is so incredibly informative, and I think that this is something that everybody needs to know about, and I'm so glad that... Uh, I, I'm actually really glad that someone like you is actually in D.C. and is you know taking care of this and actually working on this and doing this really, really important work. So thank uh, you. Can I, can I, before you close, um, we talked about a lot of, uh, uh, you know, tragic, uh, stories and issues. Let's also talk about a few things that should make us feel proud of being a, a member of a democratic society. Yes. Uh, the United States government has been, uh, incredibly, uh, uh, vocal from the beginning, uh, it took uh, two, three years to get to the point of uh, uh, utilizing legal tools uh, to sanction human rights abusers. It is so significant. Uh, the Global Magnitsky Act, uh, namely, was uh, promoted and put in place with an advocate uh, by the name uh, Bill Browder. Mm -hmm. who was the client of Sergei Magnitsky, who died in a Russian prison, uh, were tortured to death. Initially, that law uh, was Magnitsky Act, uh, enacted in 2012, and then become a global Magnitsky Act in 2016. So it has a, a global reach. And because of that uh, uh, legal tool being put in place by the United States Congress, Canada and others, uh, even Estonia has similar legal measure. Uh, that has been implemented even in a, a short uh, a period of time. To me, in, in, uh, you know, getting something like that done in two years is, is quite a remarkable uh, achievement. From the time that this has been uh, advocated by activists and some members of Congress till today uh, is, is, a, is a milestone. Uh, the Early this month, the U.S. government sanctioned four Chinese officials, one of them is the person that I mentioned earlier, serves, actually sits in a powerful Politburo in Beijing. This is the first time that the U.S. government imposed sanction on a sitting uh, senior government official. And today uh, there was another announcement, uh, which is uh, Xinjiang Production Construction Corp. Uh, the uh, this, uh, this uh, Today's uh, decision, sanctioned a paramilitary with uh, 2.5 million to 3 million troops that have been responsible for much of the human rights abuses, including forced labor uh, uh, internment camps initially. And also this entity, the uh, uh, XPCC is the acronym, uh, has its own school, universities, uh, hospitals, a parallel government, and prison system. So they have been controlling much of the water resources, cotton fields, and now uh, the United States government sanctioned that entity. And also on top of that, uh, 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 in the last several months, uh, US, US Co uh, Commerce Department added uh, 48 Chinese entities to the um, uh, Commerce Department's entity list as part of Bureau of Industrial Securities, a designation based on national security concern. Of those 48, 21 entities are government. Like the entire police department in the Uyghur region have been added to the list. And more significantly, for the first time in the Uyghur's modern history or human history, United States Congress uh, uh, passed and, and enacted a law, uh, Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act. And there's also two more pieces of legislation currently being discussed. The reason that I am bringing this up, in the face of, in light of these uh, uh, legislative and executive decision, 
uh, both uh, unprecedented and historic nature, uh, did not break up the diplomatic relationship with China. So I encourage other governments to consider this is a matter of conscience. This is a uh, uh, this is about who we are as a society, as a free people. You know, you can criticize about certain bad uh, uh, actors all day long, but they're not going to change their behavior unless you force them to. The only force can come through your own action. Uh, so I, I, I call on the governments and individuals around the world who has um, uh, access to power or who are in power uh, to exercise that very freedom uh, and, 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 uh, based on the conscience and to do the right thing and get on the right side of the history. No, I and well said. I completely and I'm already. I think I, we already have some ideas of what we'll do with our, you know, relatively small platform. Yeah. Well, it's much bigger than than people think, but still, um, especially with this the 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 secular community in the Muslim world, because there are, there are many activists is growing very very fast, uh, and this is something that we want to raise awareness about, and especially the things that we can do. Yes, those yeah. principles and practices. And also, uh, Ali, uh, people should not mix up the government versus the decision being made. Yes. Uh, yeah. You know, we want our governments to do the right thing. You may not like a certain politician or certain individuals in power, but our governments is charged to serve the people when they do the right thing. I think acknowledging it uh, with an objective peace of mind is a good habit. I absolutely agree with you. Yeah. Absolutely agree with you. If we had more time, we would. I would like. I would have continued talking about uh, United States record on supporting human rights. Sometimes it's not. I mean, not sometimes. A lot of times it's not. Um, it violates its own standards by supporting countries like Saudi Arabia, right. um, and the war against the Yemeni's people. But that would be a topic of a different of discussion topic. of another show. But I would. I would have. If we had time, I would have touched on this. <laughs> but. <laughs> But but again, thank you so much. This was very very helpful. And can Ali, uh, can we ask our guests where can people find uh, yes. his work? Yeah. If if anybody wants to uh, follow you, or maybe on on social media, or just find you or contact you, um, uh, uh, how how can they do it? I am quite active on Twitter. Uh, just Nuri Turkel. Uh, just one, you know, my first name last name together would be a good place to look for me. Okay, great. So I'm going to, uh, we'll put that in the description uh, of the show. Not this YouTube video because it's the live stream, but in the uh, final uh, audio version. episode that's going to come out. And we're going to prioritize this and make sure this gets out uh, really soon. Um, we should, you should also know that Majid Nawaz, I don't know if you know about him. Uh, he is a, yeah. he's also an uh, activist who has recently gone on hunger strike for this issue. And he did, yeah. uh, he, he did a lot of work to really get this out there. He got it out to, Nigel Farage, he got Nigel Farage's attention. He got J.K. Rowling's attention. Um, and he DM'd a lot of us just individually yeah. uh, to get us to raise attention. So you know, kudos to him as well. And yeah. he didn't DM, he didn't DM me for some reason, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. Um, thank, thank you, you. thank you, Armin. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with your um, uh, audience. Uh, I'm profoundly grateful. Uh, I enjoyed this conversation, despite mm -hmm. the the grim nature of the topic. I know that uh, same here. Like we're just, I think we're very inspired to start doing something, especially that now that this uh, is getting attention. So thank you. I need to say thank you in a weaker way, putting my hand on my. Oh, hand. really? Like uh, this? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> how do you say? Is, is that how you say you're welcome as well? Uh, yes, uh, you're welcome. Uh, okay. Greetings. Thank you. Everything you uh -huh. have. Your hand and the heart. You know, this should be new norm in the COVID world. We should not. Change oh yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. It's sort of perfect, isn't it? It's great. I like it. <laughs> ahead of time, I'm, I'm, anyway, I'm going to do. I'm going to. I'm going to do some cultural appropriation. And I'm going to use this. I'm gonna... <laughs> right. Stay, stay right. safe um, yeah. and keep doing what you're doing. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, you're a hero. Um, you're doing you. amazing work. So thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. And thank bye, bye, everybody. And please share this video. Please, please, please. Anyways, thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>